Hallelujah. You know, the one thing about that story that I hope wrecks your wrong thinking about coming back to God. It, in, at the end of that story, when the prodigal comes home, the father's waiting. The son, I believe, is walking home because of shame, guilt, condemnation, and the fact that he just came out of the pig pen and he stinks. And in the story, it says that the father runs to the son and falls on his neck and kisses him. That's the welcome home of a father. The son is walking home slow. The father hastens the return by running to him, disregards his condition, interrupts. He allows him to speak long enough as he shares the brokenness of his heart and repentance. Because without repentance, there's never restoration. There's always repentance before restoration. And before he allows him to go any, into any debasing, which is not what it's about, he immediately begins to restore dignity and esteem and declare value over him. So understand that's what the Father has for you. Amen. Well, you go, go ahead and be seated. It's so good to be here today. Uh, this week, all of us from New Life have thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. Thank you for loving, receiving, and, and the way we've been treated. I have to uh, also thank you, uh, my son Stephen. Uh, Stephen and Ram, really a big part of me getting connected with Pastor Shane and and uh, the way you have uh, not only treated uh, Ram, one of my spiritual sons, but the way you've treated Stephen, my natural son, the way you have loved on him and appreciated him and encouraged him, I, I, I can't thank you enough. I think one of the reasons um, Shane and I also connect besides just heart and our love for God and, and neither one of us is normal is we both uh, have been blessed with the same um, issue in life called ADD. And if you don't understand ADD, you'll think we're rude, and we're not. It, it took Shadi and I a while. Well, no, it didn't take me a while. It took her a while to figure out what was going on. Because with ADD, you have concentration for a certain period. And then after a while, you're done, and you go this way. And you left the other person in the middle of a conversation, and they think, why did you just change? Well, I was done. They weren't, but you were. And, and what, but what happens, the, the, the wonderful thing about ADD is when you're under pressure, you can really, really focus. And we thrive on pressure. Of course, the challenging thing about that is we cause other people to come under our pressure. But life's an adventure. Amen. You, uh, in being here with you, you know, uh, I've, of course, I've drank more. Uh, is that the same guy that was messing with your mic? Uh, in the last couple of days, I've drank more coffee than I have in the last month, I think. But the way that you have treated us, and I share this in the first service, uh, is, is so wonderful. And there's a difference between a spirit of excellence, which a lot of places, and, and I've traveled all over the world, and a lot of people work to develop a spirit of excellence because they want to do things excellently. And I, I believe we want to give the best of our ability to something. But there's a difference between a spirit of excellence and an excellent spirit. And the Bible talks of an excellent spirit. The Bible doesn't talk about a spirit of excellence. That's doing things right. You can do things right outwardly and still have a sucky attitude. You can still have a wrong heart and try to do things right. But when you have an excellent spirit, the foundation of what you do comes from the attitude and the motive within. And when things are right on the inside, it will always protect what you do on the outside. So it never becomes a performance or a show looking for recognition. It's done through genuineness of heart. And, and I want to commend you. The culture of your house is so strong and it's so wonderful. You must guard it and protect it because it, it has touched us and I believe it touches everyone who visits you. I want to share something today that I believe is, is, is a word that I've had in my heart uh, for, this, for this church since I've been here, and I've seen it proved out in a couple days as we've been here in, in Summit. In the book of Revelation, John is writing to the seven. He's, he's writing concerning the seven churches, and usually we get into the book of Revelation. People don't get too excited. 
But the first church that he begins to write about is Ephesus. Ephesus is a church of great influence. Enjoy is a church of great influence. Wow, and the only people that say to amen were the people from New Life. Uh, okay, let me try that again. Um, enjoy is a church of great influence. And, and what I want to share with you today, I really believe it is a word that God has for your house because he wants to guard and preserve and protect what's valuable in this house because he, he has things for you. That, that it's not something you dream up for yourself. It's something that heaven has. Churches are birthed because God has a plan. Some churches are birthed because man has a plan and they're man's idea. We don't want man's idea. We want, don't want good ideas. We want God ideas. And God has purposed enjoy church, and there's things he wants to do in and with and through you as a church. And so when I read in, in Revelation chapter 2, Verse 1, as he first begins to write, to Eph uh, he says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write this, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, that you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered, you have patience, you have labored for my name's sake, and you have not become weary. It's all good. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you. Now, it's only one thing, but how many of you know if God has one thing against you, it's one too many things. He says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember there from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Do the first works. What's the first works? Well, is the first works the, uh, the preaching, the teaching, the labor? You know, when Jesus called his disciples, it says that he called them alone that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to teach and to heal and to deliver. And if you ask most people, what is the first thing that Jesus called his disciples to do? They'll say, well, teach, preach, you know, heal the sick, cast out devils. No, the first thing he called his disciples to do was to be with him. See, the being with him enables you to do the other stuff. If you don't be with him, then you begin to fail later on in your abilities because who you become determines what you do. Being always precedes doing. And so he says, listen, you need to repent from that because otherwise I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from your place. In other words, the light of who I've called you to be will be removed. And and so he's writing to the church at Ephesus, and, and of, other, of the seven churches that he writes to, Ephesus is a very, very strong church. It's where Timothy was pastoring. And so this, what I want to share with you today is, is as Paul writes to Timothy, and Timothy is, is very, very important to Paul. He calls him his spiritual son, and he says, I have no one like him. And also, Timothy is the only person we see in the New Testament that has two books written to him. 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. We see other books, 1 and 2 Corinthians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. But there's nobody else in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul, this father, he said, you may have 10,000 uh, instructors or teachers in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. And as we've talked about the Father's house, if you want the Father's house, you need to have the Father's heart. Amen. And so here we have this father writing to a son in 1 and 2 Timothy, but this son is the pastor at Ephesus. And Paul communicates things to Timothy when he's writing to the church. So you have this, this letter written to the church at Ephesus to his son, who he writes two letters to. But even in Corinthians and Philippians, he's still talking about Timothy. You have this affection and this connection with Timothy. And so when he writes to Ephesus, he's communicating something very powerful. And I pray I can get this out because I really believe God wants you to get this. Amen? Are you ready? Um, understand when, when he corrects the church, you've left your first love. The greatest commandment is what? That we love God. That we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we love our neighbors, ourselves. My ability to love people is only because I love him first. My, my love for him and my trust in him, because who you really, really love and who you trust, you'll follow. 
You're, you're not, there, there is no fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. He who fears has not yet been made perfect or has not matured in love. Because when you know someone truly, truly loves you, you trust them and there is no fear in that. And so allowing the reality of the love of God to become a part of your heart and your life, it begins to remove the fear. When you understand how loved you are, you will not fear certain areas of your life. You will trust God with your future. If you can trust him with your eternity, you can certainly trust him with your temporary here on earth. Amen. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to read this, and, and most of the verses I'm going to read are going to be in the Amplified Classic. And, and, and as I read these verses, I, I want you to listen to them. Read them, listen to them, write down these notes. If you don't have an Amplified Classic, of course, with all the different things you have, you can just look it up on a screen somewhere. But I want you to let the richness of these words come in. I, I, I don't want to just leave an impression upon your mind that excites you for a moment, brings you a little emotional high, and you go, oh, that's really good. And then it be, Because memories fade and emotions can, can wane, but what you allow to be imparted in your heart becomes a part of you. Allow, a allow the word to become a deposit on the inside of you so it begins to work inside. Let these words speak to you. Ephesians chapter 1, look what Paul says. For this reason, because I've, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. Right here, he is pointing out a distinguishing factor of the church at Ephesus. What is the distinguishing factor? The love that they have for people. Well, the love that they have for people is obvious, is there because of the love that they have for him. Now, later on, John is writing that they let go of that. And so if they, would, if they would have held on to what Paul said here, it would have protected and preserved them for the longevity of what God has for them. If you've been here in Summit, let me tell you, one of the things that has been communicated in these meetings is the priority of guarding our affections and, and, and our focus and our love for God must be maintained. And what God is wanting to do here in this church collectively, corporately, and individually is to make sure that your focus is Him. That if we'll guard that and preserve that, it will protect us, it will keep us, and we will have longevity and we will fulfill everything that God has for our lives. So the distinguishing factor in the beginning here is for this reason, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love. You see, your faith in him and love for people, your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, the people of God. So I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the wonderful things about Paul when he writes this, understand this, these words are timeless. The Word of God is timeless. It's written by inspiration of God. It's written on, by the spirit of prophecy. This is not just simply the Apostle Paul writing a letter to Timothy. These are words that the Spirit of God has ordained to be spoken, not just to Ephesus, but to the church. And they mean as much today as they did 2,000 years ago. See, the Word of God, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's written under the spirit of prophecy. That's how Moses wrote the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And God said, how does Moses know? He was not there. No man was there. Adam hadn't even been created yet. Yet Moses is writing about something that happened in the beginning. How do you do that? By the spirit of prophecy. All Scripture comes by the spirit of prophecy. It is a timeless, eternal word. So these words are just as alive and well for you in joy, Melbourne, as they were Ephesus. And I believe that's the kind of church that you are. You are a church of influence. So allow these words to speak to you. Tell the person next to you, say, this is for us. And Paul doesn't exaggerate like some of us do. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he would grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, of insight into mysteries and secrets. What is a mystery? Something not yet revealed, something not yet known. God has mysteries, secrets, things not yet known. He wants you to see and know and understand. There's days of wow and woe and oh my coming to this church. 
that he would grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. What's, where does that come from? That comes from the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. Isaiah chapter 11, talking about Jesus, said, And the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, and might, and the fear of the Lord. And it goes on to say that he would not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor by the hearing of his ears. And where you're going, you cannot judge by the sight of your eyes or by the hearing of your ears. It will take wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Where does that come from? It comes from the Spirit of God who lives and dwells on the inside of you. I carry the Spirit of wisdom. I carry the Spirit of knowledge. I carry the Spirit... That's who you have on the inside. Not what, but a who. And that who is always talking. When you, when you look at 1 Corinthians, I had to put this in here. Uh, we, a lot of times we, we would digress or, or go to uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for him. And so we just kind of stop there and go, oh, well, well, okay, sirrah, sirrah. Whatever will be, will be. No, 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 no. Keep reading. Everybody say, keep reading. Then it goes on to say, but. But. Everybody say, but. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Say all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man can know the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Why? That we might, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Given, not earned, not worked for, not created, given, given. Everybody say given. Your purpose, your calling, your future, given, created, planned ahead of time. It's given. You need to see and know. And this is what Paul is praying for the church collectively, corporately, and it fits for you individually. Pray this over yourself, your family, but you must grab this as a church. It's written to the church. You need to see and know that the eyes of your understanding would be flooded with light. So you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you. He's talking to the church, not just you individually, but to the church. And how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set-apart ones. So you can know and understand. See, know, understand. Say that. Say, see, know, understand. It is not God's plan for you to walk around clueless individually or corporately. It's time to see and know and understand and grasp and lay a hold of what he's called us to as a church. You have a purpose as a church. And it's not just to get bigger. It's not just to be successful. You have a city to touch. You have a nation to reach. You have a world to bring change to. The eyes of your heart flooded with light. So you can know and understand the hope to which he's called you. And how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set-apart ones. And so that you can know. There's a whole lot of knowing going on here. So that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable, unlimited, and surpassing greatness. Immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe. As demonstrated in the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named. Above every title that can be confirmed, not only in this age, in this world, but also in the age and the world that are to come. And he's put all things under his feet and appointed him the universal and supreme head of the church. A headship exercised throughout the church, which is his body, his body, his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. For in that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete and who fills everything everywhere with himself. How wonderful when we can come together and he fills everything everywhere with himself. Say, that's our house. Oh, come on, everybody. Say, that's our house. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship. God doesn't make junk. First class. Come on, say first class. 
We are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand. In other words, God has some things he wants us to get involved in. We work together with him. Our obedience, our faithfulness, we work together with him. When we pray, we work together with him. That we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us. Planned beforehand for us. Taking paths which he prepared ahead of time. See, Pastor Shane's responsibility is not to create the future of the church. It's to discover what's been prepared ahead of time. So it's not man's plan, it's God's plan. But God puts the plan in a man, and that man communicates it, and he communicates the vision, and we begin to walk out that which has been prepared ahead of time. So we, what we realize is we're fulfilling heaven's plan and heaven's purpose. It's not the ambition of a man. Now, some men are ambitious. It's good to be driven. But ambition can be brought to pass with a lot of hard work and good planning. Vision without God, it's impossible. Vision depends on God. Ambition, you can bring that to pass in the flesh. God's not interested in the flesh. He wants something bigger than you because he created it before you, but he created you to walk in what he planned beforehand. He prepared ahead of time. Are you with me? That we should walk in them living the, come on, say good life. What kind of life does he have for you? Broke life, sad life, sick life, poor life, addicted life? No, a good life. Living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. God never planned for you to create a will. He just wants you to discover what he has for you. Because the creator of heaven and earth has something for you. And I know he, uh, Shane has been giving Ryan a hard time today. Ryan, I don't know where she is, but let me tell you, she's going to be beautiful. She's going to be wonderful. And when you meet her, you're going to be like Adam and go, whoa. That's where a woman came from. The first part of that was, whoa. I mean, Adam been looking at, at giraffes and rhinos and elephants and bugs. And I mean, you know, Adam named everything before Eve came. God's smart. He didn't want strife in the garden. Adam, that's going to be an elephant. She'd go, no, no, no. What? He just let Adam name it, then he brought Eve. Anyway, never mind. Let's get back. Let's stay in the spirit here. Living the good life which he prearranged, prearranged, prearranged. Say prearranged. And made ready, made ready, made ready. Made, it's ready, it's ready, it's ready. It's re He's, God has a life made ready for you. What do you need? You need to see and know and become aware. See and know and become aware. And say, I see it, I know it, I understand it. And you choose to begin to walk it out. Now let me jump over into Philippians chapter 2. And the reason I want to jump to Philippians chapter 2 is because here, Paul, even in Philippians chapter 2 in Corinthians, he is still making references to Timothy. Because whatever we want to walk in, Philippians 2.13 in the Amplified says, not on your own strength. Not on your own strength. Aren't you glad? Not in your own ability. Not on your own strength. It is God. It is God who is all the while effectually at work in you. Energizing and creating in you the power and the desire. Sister Shadi and I are finishing up year number 40 in the Philippines. Why? Because God, it's not in my own strength. I'm not that good. I'm not that nice. But you see, when you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desire of your heart. Inner God is, see, not in your own strength. It is God who is all the while, all the while, all the while, effectually at work in you, energizing and creating, energizing and creating power and desire. And with that power that he creates, he energizes it. I mean, with that desire he creates, he energizes it with power. So the ability to walk out the desire, the desire came from him, and the ability to fulfill it came from him. What does he want you to do? See, know, understand, and say, come on, I I'll follow you. I trust you. I'll walk this life out. I'll I'm all yours. Come on, we were singing it. Not in your own strength. It is God who is all the while effectually at work in you energizing and creating new power and desire, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, satisfaction, and delight. 
And do all things without grumbling and fault finding, complaining against God and questioning, doubting among yourselves. That you may show yourselves to be blameless, guileless, innocent, and uncontaminated. Children of God. Children of God without blemish, faultless, unrebukable in the midst of a crooked and wicked generation. Spiritually perverted and perverse. Among whom you are seen as bright lights, stars, beacons shining out clearly into a dark world. Holding out an offering to all men. The word of life. That is in the day of, of Christ. Paul says that I would have something to rejoice in glory. That I did not run my race in vain. Or spend my labor to no purpose. He goes, even if my life is poured out as a drink offering to God, I'm glad to do it, and I congratulate all of you in your share in what we're doing together. And then as you go on, I'm not, which I'm running out of time here, he goes on to talk about Timothy. See, he's still, he's, he's pulling back into Timothy. He says, I don't have anybody like Timothy, who's going to come because everybody else cares about their own thing, but Timothy would genuinely come because he cares about you. See, this is the pastor of the church at Ephesus. You have, a, you have pastors that genuinely care for you. They have a father's heart because in the father's house, you have to have the father's heart. And then Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, Paul again which is very rare that we see this in the New Testament. We see it more in Ephesians than any other book where Paul begins to pour out his prayer. It's for this house. It's for this church. For this reason, seeing the greatness of this plan. There's a great plan of why you are built together in Christ. In joy, there is a great plan of why you have been brought together in Christ. It is not the idea of a man. It was the plan of the Father. This great, the greatness of the plan of which you're being built together in Christ. I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. That Father from whom all fatherhood takes its title and derives its name, that He would grant you out of the rich treasury of his glory, to be strengthened and reinforced with mighty power in the inner man by the Holy Spirit himself, indwelling your innermost being and personality. And may Christ, through your faith, actually dwell and settle down and abide and make his perfect home in your hearts. And this is where Paul, communicating to the church at Ephesus to give them a word, to sustain them, to strengthen them, to keep them, so they do not deviate from that which what God is wanting to do in the church. That you would be rooted deep in love, founded securely on love. That you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love and what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know how deep it is, to know how wide it is. That you may really come to know practically to experience for yourself not a description of Jesus but a demonstration of Jesus. Man, don't tell me how good the chocolate cake is. Just let me have a bite and you don't have to talk anymore. Once I take a bite of that cake, your words don't mean anything anymore. I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. You can describe it all you want, but your words do nothing like a personal experience. That you would practically, through experience for yourself, the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. And that you may be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God that you would have the richest measure of the divine presence. That's what it's supposed to bring us to. And become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. The church. A body filled and flooded with God. Enjoy 
filled and flooded with God. Enjoy. Come on. Filled and flooded with God. Coming into this house in a place that is filled and flooded with God himself. That is what takes us into the greater. Now to him who by, in the consequence of what we have just talked about, because of what he's doing, now to him, because of the power that is working in us, because of the height and the depth and the length and the breadth and the width of the love of God, because we have this experience beyond just mere knowledge, because of the love of God that is working on the inside of us, he is now able to carry out his purpose. And do super abundantly. Say this with me. Say super abundantly. Oh, don't say it like you're bored. Come on. Say super abundantly. Far over and above all we dare ask. Think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, dreams. In other words, God is saying, I have some things prearranged, prepared ahead of time. Already made ready, made ready. It's already ready. You don't have to dream it up. You don't have to plan it up. You just have to see and know and understand. And what will happen is because of the, le- the, the depth and the width and the length of the height, because of the priority of my love for you and your love for me and what you guard and preserve, I am now able to do exceed. I have things for you you've never dreamed about. I have things you've never prayed about. It hasn't come into your imagination. And because it hasn't come into your imagination, you haven't even gone that far. And God is saying, go ahead, stretch, go far. But I have things for you beyond what you dare ask, beyond what you think, dream, hope, or imagine. And then it says, now to him be glory in the church. And in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. So what he's doing in this church will continue to be generational. Oh, church of Melbourne, enjoy this Ephesus influential church. Guard and preserve and protect what he's doing in your hearts. Because he has this infinite above and beyond all you could air, dash, dare, ask, dream, hope, or imagine. Days of incredible are before you. Shane, come on up. I'm just going to pray over you, and I'm going to have Pastor Shane do the altar call for the... I want the father of the house to do that. Father, I thank you that you are filling us with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I thank you for a spirit of seeing and knowing and understanding and grasping. And I thank you that your love for us and its height and depth and width and length continues to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And there is no limit to what you're doing in this house, with this house, and through this house. I thank you for the incredible, incredible days upon this house, this church, and these people in Jesus' name.